Hey there, miniature painters. Today we have a short sidestep in our painting journey as we paint up the other Nyarlathotep for Cthulhu Death May Die Fear of the Unknown. For this piece, I decide to deviate from the game art again and whip up a little fire OSL glow that should be thematic for this character's gameplay ability, where investigators are set ablaze by Nyarlathotep's attacks. More importantly, this rattle can OSL will add some much needed contrast to the character's final color scheme. Welcome to Treehane Miniatures. Sometimes looking at the game art fails to inspire the painting process, and while I do enjoy this piece of artwork, which is perfectly dark and thematic, it isn't a color scheme that necessarily makes me want to break out my paintbrush and get to work. The violet hues in the flesh and dark oranges in the cloak give me a little something to go on, but I still want more. I decide to take a cue from the character's ability that ignites poor hapless investigators on a whim and create a fire OSL effect on the back side of the mini. To do this, I begin with a miniature that is fully primed in black, then I use Rust-Oleum Colonial Red spray paint to establish the base for the orange OSL glow. I am not trying to achieve complete opacity on any part of the miniature with this. These Rust-Oleum spray cans put out such a high volume of paint that I'm using it very cautiously to spray a mist over the miniature. And even though the paint will be hitting the model from the upper right side, I begin the spray well below the miniature and quickly move the flow of paint up and past the model. I'm using this fine mist of red paint to inform me where the light would hit the character. I will refine this red base layer further during the painting process. This is a fairly simple character to paint, consisting of just three main items. The skin, the cloak, and the OSL. I decide that a dark blue-gray cloak will be a nice complement to the firelight, so I begin with a base coat of blue-black Proacryl. These Monument Hobbies paints seem to go on much brighter than they appear when dry, much more so than I've seen with other paint brands. This can be alarming when you're going for a dark moody paint scheme. I usually just trust that it'll all work out. I want the natural light to come from the character's upper left side, so I'll apply this coat of dark blue more thoroughly there, whereas I'll work a little more haphazardly in the recesses on the character's far right side. I take this blue up to the point where it meets the red glow. I don't want to cover any of the red, and I feel that it's even okay to leave a small amount of black separation between the two colors. Taking a cue from the character art, I use Dark Plum as the base for the flesh. I think at this point that I've decided to use Dark Plum as the base layer for all of the miniatures in this game. If you've seen some of my past work, you may know that I like to use the same final highlight color for all of the miniatures that I paint from a single game to make it appear as though they're all interacting with the same environment when they're presented together on the table. I like to use something like Ice Yellow or Bright Pale Yellow for this final highlight. For Cthulhu Death May Die Seasons 3 and 4, I'll try to use the same shadow color for all of the miniatures as well. And Dark Plum seems like as good a choice as any. We'll see how this all works out as we get deeper into this pile of miniatures. I picked up a trifecta of gray paints from Duncan Rhodes' Two Thin Coats line that I'm going to use for the skin. I mixed Death Reaper into the Dark Plum to create a shadow layer. This has an ashy gray appearance that I really like for this character. It may be a little darker than the Dark Plum was on its own, but I think this sets up a natural progression to the lighter grays that are going to follow, while still maintaining some of that violet that I want to be present in the flesh. Most, but not all, of the Dark Plum is covered with this layer. Next, I mix Wizard Gray into the Dark Plum to create a lighter grayish purple color. This will be the final layer that includes the Dark Plum, as from here I transition to pure gray layers. I'm layering this onto most of the upward and outward facing areas on the left side of the character's skin, and I'm establishing the base area for subsequent highlights. This includes the lower jawline on the left side. Because of the way that the arms are positioned, I highlight the right arm more towards the lower forearm and wrist, and I highlight the left forearm closer to the elbow. This may seem counterintuitive because these parts of the arms are further away from the imaginary light source, but these are also the parts of the forearm that would be affected more by that light. Now I start building all of the highlights using pure wizard gray. This color is added to all of the prominent features of the model like the nose, ear, cheekbone, and brow. I feel that the most important highlights for this piece are along the upper left side of his cranium and across the forehead. I want to maintain these extreme highlights as depicted in the character art. I'm not doing anything with the right side of the face for now because this will get highlighted with the orange glow a little later in the process.
Next, we jump straight to pure carcuridon gray to continue building the highlights. This is applied to every part of the model that was previously painted with the wizard gray, but I'm covering less area within the existing wizard gray layer. I apply these sparingly to the most highlighted parts of the hands and forearms, since this will be the final highlight for those areas. The next two highlight layers will just be focused on the face and head. Moving on, I'm adding some bright pale yellow to the Carcuridon Gray. These highlights are just dotted into place with the tip of the brush for the facial features that I want to really stand out. I'm no longer placing a highlight on the lower jawline, and this mix will be the brightest highlight for the nose and chin. The final extreme highlight for the face is solely bright pale yellow. This will add a final glint of light to the forehead near the temple, the outermost part of the left eyebrow, and the right cheek. These are tiny dots of paint that don't even appear as yellow in the grand scheme of things. I also use this to dot in some tiny reflections in the dark eyes. The eyes are otherwise left dark and not painted. With what is arguably the most important feature of this model out of the way, it's time to start highlighting the dark blue-gray cloak. I'm using Iron Wolf by the Army Painter. I paint this on pretty fast and sloppy, as I'm only trying to hit the upward-facing folds that are facing to the character's left. And since this appears to be some raggedy cloth, I'm free to create some texture with my strokes. I don't have to worry about smooth application of layers, like I did with the skin. Let's jump to some Wolf Gray by the Armory Painter for the main highlight color of the cloak. This is focused mostly on the extreme left of the miniature's torso, with a little added to the flared out cloth on its right. Once again, I'm free to create some texturing with quick, short strokes and some stippling. This is just about it for the cloak. I want this component of the miniature to remain relatively subdued when compared to the face in the orange OSL. The final highlight for the cloak consists of bright pale yellow and wolf gray. This is only placed on the upper torso around the collar area to draw attention toward the face. These are very tiny highlights, and the cloak is all wrapped up in just a matter of seconds. It appears that I've overlooked some small metal rings on the cloak. I decide to quickly cover these with some gunmetal metallic paint. This is a pretty dark metallic silver, but still much too bright for this character's dingy garb, so I grab some light rust by Vallejo and haphazardly dot it over the gunmetal to make it look a little more weathered. Then I coat just these areas with a little Nuln Oil to tie it all together and knock down some of the brightness of the metallic paint and the orange rust. And now for the best part, the OSL. I began with a light mist of Colonial Red spray paint, so now I will solidify that dark red base by brushing over the high points with some burnt red Pro Acryl. I'm not covering all of the spray paint layer. The mist effect of the spray paint allows the color to naturally diminish into the darker outer edges of the spray. I want this natural transition to remain in place, so I make sure not to brush the burnt red all the way to the outer edge of the colonial red layer while doing this. To begin building the orange OSL glow, I use some thinned clear orange Vallejo paint and start brushing it over the red. This is accomplished in several layers. Each brushstroke is drawn from the darker red outer foundation towards the source of the orange fire glow, which I imagine to be on the character's back right side. It's important for this effect to draw the paint in a single direction, towards the emanating light source. Each subsequent layer of clear orange will cover less area, beginning a little closer to the light source and terminating at the brightest point closest to the light source. This way the orange will appear to naturally diminish in intensity the further it gets from the source of the orange glow. For the next level of reflection, I use a mix of ice yellow and clear orange thinned with water. For the clothing, this is the ultimate highlight that is mostly just added to the edges and raised folds in the cloth. The extreme outer edge of the right shoulder is the only flat surface that gets a little extra of this bright highlight. The skin, on the other hand, is shinier than the clothing and therefore would reflect more light, so I'm a little more generous with the bright highlight mix there. The main highlights for the face are located on the right cheekbone, the edge of the ear, and the path that runs along the upper right side of the skull. The upper arm, wrist, and fingers will all get a little brightening as well. 
This final OSL highlight will only affect the skin. The skin should be shinier than the cloth, so I want to make sure that it looks like it is reflecting more light. I use ice yellow to carefully dot in a few central bright spots on the head, cheek, ear, forearm, and fingers. To paint this orange light reflection, I'm basically using desaturated versions of the same colors that I would use to paint fire. Whereas I would use bright reds, bright oranges, and bright yellow to paint fire, here, I'm using much duller versions of those colors to paint how I think the light would be reflected by various surfaces. I want the orange on this model to look like it is interacting with the light source and not emanating light itself, if that makes sense. Finally, let's knock out that goat leg with a base coat of German camo black brown, followed by a mid-tone layer that consists of a mix of black brown and necrotic flesh. Lastly, I use a little necrotic flesh to lightly add some life to a few strands of goat hair. The hoof is painted equally as fast with a base coat of necromancer cloak. A little area of iron wolf is then brushed onto the front of the hoof. Then, the hoof is finally edge highlighted with a little wolf gray. Simple. All right, that wraps up painting the other Nyarlathotep for Cthulhu Death May Die. I'll have another small miniature painted up for you next week before I tackle Azathoth the following week. Thank you so much for watching. Please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Seriously, subscribe now. It's easy and free.